and welcome everyone. My name is Anne Siskos. I work as a program advisor at IHN. I have several other roles there as well. My professional background is education, but I'm also a graduate of IHN. It's my pleasure today to welcome Lisa Patilkila for our webinar, Minerals, Emotions, and Mental Health. It's an excerpt from the upcoming continuing education course called Hair Tissue Mineral Analysis Practitioner Level One. It is an IHN collaboration with Lisa, and it's our seventh run of the program. It's very popular. It will be running online live over Zoom for six Tuesdays starting on March 19th. And registration has begun. It does typically fill up quickly. For more information and to register, go to the IHN website. You'll find it under the Continuing Education tab. But shortly, I'll let Lisa speak a little bit more about the course. Now, the format for today, the webinar will be, Lisa says, about 50 minutes or so, followed by a Q&A after that. If you think of questions while the presentation is going on, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and I'll, I'll grab those at the end. Now, before I introduce Lisa, I'm very excited to share with you that we have a webinar giveaway today. The giveaway is a Trace Elements HTMA test kit and a customized results report a review of the initial client intake, and a 60-minute consultation with Bicon Health. This is a super valuable giveaway. If you want to be eligible for it, we're going to be doing the draw at the very end of the evening. So good luck to you all. Now about our presenter. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Lisa Patel Gila. Lisa is highly knowledgeable and skilled and is a leader in her field. Lisa is certified in functional diagnostics, which bridges the gap between clinical nutrition and functional medicine. She is a mineral analysis expert, a board certified holistic health practitioner with the American Association of Drugless Practitioners and a long standing member of the Association of Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioners. Lisa and her team have helped thousands to dig to the root cause of health issues by focusing on mineral balance and a holistic approach. Lisa is also the founder of Vicon Customs, a company specially, specializing in custom supplementation based on HTMA science. Now, everyone, please enjoy the talk and welcome Lisa. I now pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Anne. <clears throat> that was quite an introduction. I'm like, is that me? Who, who are you talking about? <laughs> What's happening? All right, so I'm gonna just gonna share my screen and get ready to go here. So welcome to Minerals, Emotions, and Mental Health. Let's talk about the test. And so this particular example of the test is from Trace Elements Lab in Texas. This is one of the labs that is popular in North America and the lab that we use. There are other labs as well, analytical research labs in Arizona is another. And of course, some of you are familiar with CANAL labs here in Ontario, Canada. And so when we look at the elements, there's about 37 elements the trace elements test. It's one of the most that is tested. And you can see that we've got some significant ratios, uh, toxic ratios and other ratios that we use in our analysis as well. And so we're going to dive into some of those when we get to our case study. And so the significant ratios are ratios that were discovered back in the 1970s by Dr. Eck and Dr. Watts, two of the pioneers of HTMA science. 
And the, the significant ratios really tell us a lot about what's going on in the systems and functioning of the body at a deeper level, at a cellular level. And so again, we're going to get into these a little bit more when we get to our case study near the end of the presentation. We're going to start off by talking about the big four minerals. And so this particular chart for the nutritional elements shows us our vital minerals. These are the minerals that are needed in the body in order for us to have a good health foundation. And so the big four minerals are referred to as calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. Now you can see here they are the first four minerals from left to right on the chart. And so we're going to talk about these minerals specifically and how they relate to our behaviors and our emotions. So let's start with calcium. Calcium acts as an emotional armor. And so when I mean an emotional armor, what calcium does is when it rises, it gives us a bit of a withdrawal from reality for us to protect ourselves from feeling. And so this is really important when it comes to something like a traumatic experience. And so it's very closely intertwined with trauma. And when we have a traumatic experience, such as a loss of a loved one, you know, uh, or something else, a, a car accident, right? There are many things that can cause trauma for us. And so when that happens, naturally, our calcium starts to rise to be able to protect us, to give us time to deal with what has transpired. And then it will start to reduce when we work through the emotions involved with that. It's important for the immune system functioning. It's also a structural element. So 99% of calcium is actually stored in the bones and the teeth. It regulates cell permeability. And so this is a, a very important one too, because when we have high tissue calcification in the body, it just means that our cells aren't going to be able to be penetrated by some of these intracellular minerals. It's going to be closing them off from where they actually need to go to be able to do the most good and the work. Important for blood clotting, maintains pH balance, supports insulin function, so very important for blood sugar regulation, and plays a role in muscle and nerve contraction. And so an interesting one too is, you know, we need calcium in balance to be able to have proper muscle contraction uh, happening as well as nerve contraction. And so it's really important. Calcium and magnesium are very closely related because calcium is on one side of this and magnesium is on the other. Now let's talk about elevated calcium and what that can mean for us from an emotional behavioral perspective. So when we have elevated tissue calcification, we can feel socially withdrawn and our thinking can be very foggy. And so I think one of the, the reasons for the, the foggy thinking is, you know, everything kind of really starts to slow down when we get a little bit calcified, right? Including our metabolism. And so things aren't as clear and aren't moving through our body the way that they should be. We could be experiencing depression or emotional suppression. Again, that distance from reality is one of the reasons, you know, calcification, again, gives us that time, a little bit of social with, uh, withdrawal uh, and acting as almost an introvert to be able to deal with, you know, trauma or other emotional issues. So introvert type behavior, very common, and a lack of motivation is also quite common when we have elevated calcium. The other thing that we can experience, and I mentioned this just a moment ago, a sluggish metabolism and energy levels. When our energy levels are low, it's very hard to feel like we're thriving, right? And that's one of the reasons that we feel that lack of motivation. Alongside that, we could have low libido, a lack of feeling right? We're, again, we're closing ourselves down. And so, you know, people with really high tissue calcification really don't feel 
joyful or have excitement. They don't get excited about things. They may not even really get sad. Like there's just a lack of feeling. We're very numb to what is happening around us and it blocks feelings from trauma. So hence why it's so closely intertwined into that uh, traumatic experience. Now, when we have low calcium, that is a whole other host of things that come along with it. You can see here in the graph, again, taken from trace elements, the calcium is 21. All of the elements are measured in milligram percent. Now, I will mention if you use Canalt Labs, if you're a practitioner that's already using HTMA, Canalt Labs measures in micrograms per grams. And so in order to compare that to milligram percent to some of the numbers we're looking at here, you need to divide the numbers of the levels by 10. Now, calcium, the ideal level for calcium is 42 milligram percent, and here it's 21, so we're about only halfway there. It's quite low. And so that can come along with feelings of nervousness and anxiety. It can also be a client or, a, or ourselves who's hypersensitive. And so hypersensitivity is exacerbated with a four lows pattern. Now, what does that mean? That means our big four minerals, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, are all below our optimal level. And so to give you those optimal levels, again, I mentioned calcium is 42 milligram percent. The optimal level of magnesium is 6. This one's at 3.3. The optimal level of sodium is 24. This one's at 6. And the optimal level of potassium is 10. And this one's at 2. So all very low. So this is a very easily identifiable four lows pattern and this person can be hypersensitive there can also be confusion when there's a lack of calcium they can be memory loss and forgetfulness physical symptoms can be tingling in the hands and the feet and the person can feel spacey potentially weak and too flexible in their thinking now on the other flip side, I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about calcium. When we think about calcium, we think about calcification. And what comes to my mind is, you know, thinking about a mountain stream kind of running down, you know, the water kind of trickling down a rock. And if that water has calcium in it, especially if it's at higher levels, you're going to see that white calcification start to um, protrude from the rock, right? It starts to, you can start to see it on the rock and it's very rigid. And so that's why I think about calcium, it's heavy, it's rigid, right? And so when we think about that calcification being rigid, when we have high calcification in the body, our thinking becomes very rigid. And, and, and when we don't have enough calcium, like in this example, now our thinking can be too flexible, right? We can't make a decision. And, and we're just, everything's flowing and we, we really just can't focus long enough. We're a little spacey and we just really can't get our thoughts together. And so that definitely is something that comes along with low calcium. So let's move on to our second big four mineral, magnesium. Magnesium is needed for hundreds of enzymatic processes in the body. Some say between two to 300, that was years ago. Research now shows anywhere from six to 800, and sometimes I even see more than that. We're discovering more and more each, each day, I feel like, where magnesium is a, a contributing factor. It's the fourth most abundant cation in the body and a key element in cellular metabolic functioning. It's involved in energy production, very important for energy production. It also contributes to cell, main perme cell membrane, sorry, permeability. Now, Remember when we talked about calcium, calcium can calcify our cells and make those shells a little hard to pass, right? Whereas magnesium does the opposite. It brings more movement to that cell membrane and, and gives us a little bit more um, fluidity, if you will. And again, magnesium is a, mo a mostly intracellular mineral. So getting in the cell is, is where we need it to be. Magnesium helps to regulate blood sugar. And so that is important with regards to magnesium and also obviously calcium for blood sugar regulation. It's involved in muscle relaxation and it reduces inflammation. As well, 
It's otherwise known as the heart mineral. And so we have to, you know, when we think about the body and the functioning, the heart is, you know, we, we need everything to be flowing well and very supple when we think about our muscles and our organs and things like that. And so magnesium is a really important part of that. And, you know, the first thing that, that you have, know, somebody has a heart attack, the first thing they're going to get when they get to the hospital um, or an onset of a heart attack, the first thing they're going to get is magnesium sulfate IV, right? To be able to calm that down and slow everything down a little bit to a more normal, relaxed level. And so high or low magnesium, a lot of times when we have minerals where there's highs or lows, there can be the same symptoms because of it. And so the interesting part about magnesium specifically is that low magnesium is low magnesium. High magnesium in many cases, especially if we have calcification, could be magnesium that isn't getting into the cell because of that cell permeability being a little bit hard to penetrate. And it's being picked up in the hair because it's in circulation rather than in the cells. So again, one of the reasons why some of the um, emotions tied to that, some of the uh, kind of uh, symptoms tied to that are the same. And so higher low magnesium, we can see irritability, we can see insomnia, depression is a big one, and muscle weakness. The other ones that come to mind as well are muscle twitches, right? We have, you know, we think about those days where maybe we, we kind of hit it hard at the gym or go for a run or even maybe even go for a walk and you get your toes kind of curling up or, or um, you know, or a muscle cramp in the back of your calf. That's really common. And uh, the other the other one that that comes about is when you're tired, right? We've we've got a stressful day. We're a little tired from yesterday, and all of a sudden your eyelid starts twitching, right? That's magnesium. That's low magnesium. Um, anxiousness is another one, right? Magnesium helps to calm us and and relax things. Schizophrenia, and then another one is addictions. And this is a big one, addictive behavior, you know, again, with magnesium deficiency, it can be driving a, a addictive behavior forward. And so this is where magnesium is very, very important. Our third big four mineral, sodium. Sodium is the solubility and volatility mineral. It is extremely volatile. It can move very quickly up and down. It's an extracellular mineral. Consider the body's great solvent because it dissolves many chemicals. Sodium is regulated primarily by the adrenals, and sodium supports the adrenals. It actually represents what we call the human battery, since it's a very good electrical conductor. It correlates with levels of stomach acid, so those with low sodium or who are in more of an exhaustive stage of stress with a little bit of adrenal insufficiency can have insufficient stomach acid due to low sodium. It regulates the body's fluid balance, pH, and blood pressure. Chronically elevated sodium levels may result in burnout. It's kind of like driving your car. If you are driving a car fast, eventually it's going to run out of gas. And so when we have chronically elevated sodium levels, it means we have the body reacting to stress. And if that stress is constant, the body starts to run out of gas. And really that that is your sodium. And, you know, we need to have adequate sodium to have our adrenals be able to respond to stress and to have stress resiliency. So again, higher low sodium, just as I mentioned with regards to magnesium, can have some of the same types of symptoms or emotions attached to it. So first one is anger, right? When we have really high sodium, we can be a little bit belligerent, we can be angry, we can be irritable. Same thing goes when we have really low sodium because we're just so exhausted. Pain, which affects mood and addictions again right so this is a really big factor when you think about the addictive behaviors that we're we're seeing uh, in people 
And now we, we have a, a reason to believe that they are intertwined with the levels of minerals in our body, which literally are our foundation of health. So what does high sodium look like on the test? You can see on the right hand side, we have a typical visual, okay? Keep it simple, visual graph, and you can see the sodium is at 159%. And so when we have a high sodium like this, we're going to have irritability, we're going to have aggressiveness, we're also going to experience mental strength, even physical strength, sodium when it gets elevated, and again, only to a certain extent when it gets, you know, I've seen sodiums up over a 1000 in some cases. And so when they get that high, we could have as much fatigue as as the others, but in general, we have a bit of a emotional and um, mental and physical strength that comes from sodium that is, you know, at a higher level. Could relate to energy, excess energy and heightened awareness. Can also bring something to the table where we are quick to judge, especially if sodium is elevated over potassium. And this goes back to a theory that was brought to the table decades ago by Dr. Malter, one of the pioneers of HTMA testing. He talks about the judge and the judge is within all of us. But the judge is related to the sodium to potassium ratio and the sodium to potassium ratio tells us about the stress that the individual is under. And as that stress increases, our judge increases and our judge is critical of ourselves can be critical of others. And so this is a dangerous area to be when you are unaware of, of this, you know, within you. If you're aware and you know what's happening, that's a different story. You can control some of it. But if you don't, you know, you could say we're a little bit more snappy. We're a little bit more irritable. We're a little aggressive and it can be a bit much for people. So that judge, you know, kind of we need to inf need to deflate the judge to a more normal level. When sodium gets too high, it definitely inflates. Now, what about low sodium? So low sodium, we talked about low stomach acid that can come alongside digestive issues, of course, and, and stimulate digestive issues because of the low stomach acid. We can have exhaustion, again, lack of motivation, a very deflated feeling. We're just, we're just exhausted, right? We just feel uh, depressed even a lack of ability to handle stress and, and usually stress of any kind, right? When you have someone who has a really low sodium, they have a really hard time dealing with any type of stress. And then a lack of care, because ultimately at the end of the day with a low sodium, especially if it's extremely low, they're just tired. So making sure we're getting enough sea salt into the system, enough good unrefined sea salt to be able to fuel our body is really important. And how do you know how much you need? Testing. Number four of the big four, potassium. Potassium sensitizes the cells to thyroid hormones. So it's very closely intertwined with the thyroid. Nerve conduction, especially in the heart. It is a mostly intracellular mineral. It's involved in carbohydrate metabolism. It's associated with cortisol levels. It regulates cell permeability. So similar to magnesium's contribution, it allows more fluidity within the cells. And it's also, of course, part of the sodium potassium pump. So that energy exchange that creates energy within our body and exchanges in our cells. Muscle contraction and relaxation is another function of potassium, and it helps to maintain fluid balance alongside calcium, magnesium, sodium, and of course, phosphorus. So high potassium, we've got the same graph again, right? Potassium here is at 86. And so we could have irritability alongside a truly high potassium. We could have physical symptoms such as diarrhea and vomiting, and the vo that vomiting can become uncontrollable if potassium is extremely elevated. We could have weakness and shortness of breath, and we could also have heart palpitations, panic attacks, and severe anxiety. So heart palpitation and panic attacks is interesting alongside anxiety because that happens when potassium is low as well. 
So again, one of those situations where the highs and the lows come with the same symptoms. And so what about low potassium? And so I will say that, that it, as a, you know, studying HTMA and doing HTMA for as long as I have, low potassium is quite common. And so the, the ticket to understanding low potassium with regards to our mental state is understanding that when potassium is extremely low, it gives a person a drive, but that drive is mental. So mental sympathetic dominance, we are mentally in fight or flight. Okay. This is more intense when the sodium to potassium, that stress ratio is high. So if our sodium is at say 20 and our potassium is at one, this is going to exacerbate that mental sympathetic drive pattern. Okay. So this equates to a person who pushes physically with excessive activities. A person who remains in fight or flight, even though their body is exhausted. So in a lot of cases, it has been said that when we are in that mental sympathetic dominant state, we're not listening to our bodies anymore. So we're pushing and pushing and pushing past where our body is physically capable of going and we end up in burnout. And so it's been said that sympathetic dominance, right, that fight or flight pattern is actually kind of a lifestyle and it, and it becomes a habit for a lot of people. And then if copper, low zinc or heavy metals are present, then the pattern stays even longer. So that's why one of the reasons when we see copper, and we're going to touch on copper a little bit today, when we see copper dysregulation alongside a really low potassium, because copper loves to drive potassium really low, that pattern sticks around a long time. And again, can really affect people's physical body because it's almost like their, their mental state just isn't intertwined and it's not listening anymore and the body is tired. So I found this a really interesting fact. We're talking about sodium, potassium, of course. So low sodium equals inadequate assertiveness. So again, a little bit of that lack of motivation. High potassium equals excessive defensiveness. So again, just interesting little excerpts of mental kind of emotional things that are coming from minerals in our bodies. And so energy, what does that equal? We talked a little bit about this in the beginning and energy equals expressing ourselves, right? When we're tired and we're exhausted, we have a lack of motivation. We don't have the energy to be able to express ourselves and be happy and joyful, right? So when someone has adequate energy, it's easy for them to be spontaneous and fun and lovable, right? We're, we're just, we're just happy and we're healthy and energetic and we accept reality without being angry and upset. We experience joy and laughter. A, a really healthy person with good energy levels can see themselves for what they really are. So what's the flip side of this? Fatigue. And that makes it really hard. It makes it really hard for someone to see themselves as they actually are because they're tired. When mineral levels become imbalanced, people gradually start to lose their sense of awareness. Right. And then again, along comes that lack of care and lack of motive, all of these things. Right. People who are ill and fatigued have a distorted view of the world and having a distorted view may have them looking at a glass half empty rather than, say, a glass half full. Having distorted mineral levels is like trying to look to the sky through a really cloudy telescope. So we're not going to be able to see everything. We're kind of, you know, in a haze, if you will. And again, so, so fatigue makes it really hard to be happy and healthy and see yourself as you actually are. And so the interesting part of that I really want to share is that 80% of the tests that have gone through Trace Elements Lab show slow oxidation. So what is that? So we just talked about fatigue, right? Slow oxidation is a is fatigue, right? It means we have a body that's stressed, it's moving into a burnout pattern, and it's tired. 
And so this is a typical graph that you'll see in slow oxidation. This one is a bit extreme. And again, we're just using this as a visual. We're not digging into, you know, assessing magnesium and things like that, because it's a bit trickier than just what's in front of us. But visually, a slow oxidation pattern has high calcium, high magnesium, and then low sodium and low potassium. And so this particular individual could be inward moving, more introverted, right? Think of that high calcium we talked about, right, earlier. Generally slower moving, right? Metabolism is slowing down. We're a little more sluggish. We like to self-reflect. We're, we're kind of looking inside. We're socially withdrawn. We're often more sad, right? We're lacking joy, lacking excitement. Just, you know, kind of there, soul searching, okay? And so, Again, this pattern is extremely, extremely common. And so now take that pattern and now let's talk about our stress ratio, the sodium to potassium. This particular one is at two and I chose this one for a purpose because when we have a sodium to potassium stress ratio that is less than 2.5 and mixed with slow oxidation that we just discussed, we have a few other things that come to the table. Now, pair it with a sodium to potassium less than 2.5, we have a depressed individual potentially getting worse. It can also lead to destructive behaviors like drinking alcohol, eating sugar, taking risks, thrill seeking, right? We need to feel alive and we need those endorphins, but it's a short lived thing to give us a short burst of energy and then it's gone. Now, if that sodium to potassium ratio is even lower, we could have depression, we could have tiredness, an unhappy person, they could be in a really truly painful place, and it could include old trauma that's there that they may or may not be dealing with. So as that ratio gets lower in combination with slow oxidation, there can be some, you know, uh, again, some mental effects here because of that. So let's flip the coin, talk about fast oxidation. So again, back to the same graph. Again, visually, we have a low calcium, low magnesium, high sodium, high potassium. So flip side of what we have for slow oxidation. So this particular individual could be happier, more superficial, a lot of time living in that ego mind, right? We're, we're more extroverted and we're upward moving and we're faster paced and right. And so all everything's really fast. And again, this ends up pushing us kind of down the road of the body eventually at some point, if, if the pattern doesn't change in a slower pace and then into burnout. Okay. Now, again, relating that to the significant ratios, again, I come back to the stress ratio, sodium to potassium, it's less than 2.5 here. And so pair that with fast oxidation, this can prove to be a very difficult time for this individual. They may have fatigue, right? That, that fast paced go, go, go. They might be starting to slow down if their sodium to potassium is less than 2.5. And again, they're, they're just probably getting ready to start moving at a slower pace. Now, what if that sodium to potassium, that stress ratio is less than one? This tells us that this particular individual may be resisting change. So, right, we're, we're firing up, we're moving fast, we're moving forward, and now all of a sudden our body, our stress ratio is completely uh, exhausted in that exhausting, exhaust, <laughs> excuse me, exhaustion stage of stress, and we may be resisting that, right? We want to get back up to where we were before. Um, they also could have been traumatized. There could be, you know, chronic stress there from being traumatized that's now, you know, driving again that pattern to a lower level. Because ultimately, fast oxidation, if there's stress, chronic stress, eventually that body will start to slow down. So let's now relate this to uh, a few conditions that I really wanted to kind of dive into. And so we're going to talk about depression, anxiety, and hyperactivity. So let's start with depression. So one of the things that causes depression and is very common cause of depression is low energy. And so it makes sense then that many cases of depression occur in slow oxidizers right? That high calcium, 
high magnesium visually and low sodium, low potassium on the test. Now, this can be closely linked to adrenal gland dysfunction, right? When our adrenals are tired and burned out, we're not going to have energy and then we could have depression. And depression can also be related to copper dysregulation. So there's a lot of different minerals to consider when we have depression on board. The other factors we have to think about, which we're going to dive into a little bit more, are also the effects of toxic metals on the body. And so toxic metals as well can contribute to depression. Mercury can commonly deposit in the brain and impair thyroid gland activity, which inhibits energy production. Remember, when we have low energy, that can lead to depression. Cadmium interferes with zinc-dependent enzymes which are needed for normal energy production. So potentially a zinc deficiency due to a cadmium toxicity or cadmium being sequestered in the body due to a zinc deficiency, so two different scenarios there, results in fatigue and potentially depression. So toxic metals can also put depression on the table for individuals. I was, as I was researching, um, I pulled an article and, and I, I kind of resonated with this one and just uh, took a small excerpt from it. And so depression and anxiety emerging from heavy metals. So it says, depression and anxiety are among the most serious disorders spread out all over the world. In most cases, patients with depression present features of anxiety. Interestingly and inversely, patients with anxiety also present depression. Thus, both disorders may occur together with one meeting criteria of the other. The extent of the two disorders has been shown through the high rates of their prevalence. They are, furthermore, associated with significant morbidity, which shows how important it is to identify and treat both illnesses. However, Several epidemiological studies have reported such illnesses to be intensified with the influence of environmental factors such as the toxic effect of heavy metals, right? It all comes down to that last statement. And so we have to make sure the first defense to our body sequestering heavy metals, if they are in our environment, is to ensure that the nutrient vital mineral status in our body is adequate and optimal because that will allow our body to be strong enough to allow them to kind of flow through and be excreted rather than be held onto and buried within us, thus causing advanced aging, conditions, disease, um, you know, so many factors. So what are some of the contributing factors to anxiety. Fast oxidizers, so remember those are the people with the high sodium and potassium, again visually, and low calcium magnesium. So they'll feel anxious from being in that chronic fight or flight response. Toxic metals, especially mercury, copper, and cadmium, can also contribute to anxiety. Nutrient deficiencies, such as calcium, magnesium, zinc, essential fatty acids, vitamins A and D, choline and inositol can also drive anxiety. High sodium and or potassium. Low potassium is another one. Four lows, remember those, the four lows pattern where the calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium were less than optimal or four highs where they're all above optimal. Both of those can cause anxiety. Extremely slow oxidation. That's another contributing factor. So you can do support for anxiety by doing mineral balancing. Hyperactivity may be related to chromium and manganese. So controlling low blood sugar can help lower the tendency towards hyperactivity. Toxic metals can also promote this condition. All toxic metals have substantial effects on the nervous system. 
They act directly on sites in the brain and they interfere with minerals. So if you've got a heavy metal in the body, it may actually be uh, interfering with a mineral that's there. And that's another contributing factor to our advanced aging process, if there's metals on board. Imbalance between copper and zinc could be another hyperactivity driver. Usually zinc is low and or the copper is either elevated or biounavailable. Fast oxidizers, so again, high sodium, potassium visually and low calcium, magnesium often have low zinc and copper. On the other hand, the slow oxidizers with the visually high calcium and magnesium and low sodium and potassium often have what we call biounavailable copper. In both cases, the copper is an issue. So let's dive a little bit into and take a different, a little, little different direction. Why to talk about heavy metals and behavior and some of the emotional ties that heavy metals bring to the table. And so how do heavy metals accumulate? Well, we've got, first of all, we have sources of heavy metals, which can be occupational, can be environmental, medical, hobbies, right? Household, food, water, cosmetic. Cosmetics is a big one personal care products, for that matter, are a big one. And a lot of people don't even realize. They enter the body through intestinal absorption. They're absorbed via the skin. They can be inhaled. Elemental forms are not really well absorbed. So those that, you know, right, that that's also an issue. And then organometallic forms can pass via membranes and even cross the blood brain barrier. So there's, there's a big way that these can enter the body. And again, our skin is our biggest organ. So when, it's, when we're breathing them in and they're around us and they're being absorbed through our skin, that's, that's an issue. And so toxic metals can actually contribute to almost any imaginable symptom and illness, including but not limited to diabetes, cancer, MS, and Parkinson's. Combinations so more than one toxic metal may actually be worse than a single toxic element as they can cause many variations of different diseases. It makes it harder to figure out what's happening. Toxic metals cause advanced aging. We don't want that, right? They weaken the body structures, they deactivate enzymes, and they have many degenerative effects. Genetic defects may actually be due to toxic metals in some cases. As they build, the body's ability to detox them decreases with the burden. So it's like a hamster wheel, right? The body's trying to detox the metals that are on board, but as they keep coming in, eventually that wheel starts to slow down and then comes to a grinding halt. And then the body has to figure out how to deal with all these metals that are accumulating. And so what do they do to us from a behavioral perspective? So uranium can cause poor sleep-wake cycles poor memory, relative anxiety, and depressive-like behavior. And uranium is very geographical. So if you're in, a, you know, in the state of California, Arizona, even some areas here in Ontario um, can have high uranium. And especially if a client is on well water or showering in well water, right? Eating root vegetables, right? Even radon gas is associated with uranium. So very important, again, monitoring with HTMA. Arsenic can cause impaired neurological functioning, especially in children, learning and memory deficits, diminished cognition, and then mood disorders like depression. Beryllium primarily affects the lungs, breathing, coughing, and shortness of breath. And it's clinically indistinguishable from sarcoidosis. So not a lot of, I guess, behavioral, emotional attachment symptoms to beryllium. These are more physical, um, but obviously associated. Mercury. Mercury is nicknamed the Mad Hatter's toxic metal due to the accumulation in the brain, which ends up causing major neurological issues. Causes the hypothalamic, hypothalamic intoxication affecting mood, emotions, and sleep. Can cause mood swings, irritability, more introverted behavior, visual and auditory disturbances, lowered motor conduction speed, and it can also cause slurred speech. Little interesting fact about mercury, 
is that low thyroid activity is related to increased mercury retention in the body. But on the flip side, mercury interferes with thyroid function. So again, I thought that I, every once in a while, I want to bring an interesting fact to the table. Cadmium. Cadmium, a hyperactivity of the nervous system, damages nerve cells. It's associated with learning disorders, interferes with the adrenal glands, production of adrenaline, can cause headaches, and difficulty responding with appropriate excitement, energy, or mood elevation to fun or stressful situations is hard. So cadmium can really kind of interfere with certain things, and it's extremely carcinogenic. Lead contributes to hyperactivity, can contribute also to fatigue. The developing nervous system of the unborn baby, infant, or young child is actually more susceptible to lead toxicity and can cause a decline in cognitive function. And the, another interesting fact is that children absorb lead at a more, more readily or higher rate than adults will. And so that's one of the reasons why dietary calcium intake strongly influences lead absorption. You, right? So children just, they, they're a bigger sponge for lead. And so we have to make sure their bodies have adequate calcium in order to make sure that their bones are filled with calcium rather than lead. And that's a really, really important factor. It's connected to violent acts of terror. In adults, it can cause irritability poor sleep and depression. Children can be reduced intelligence, learning disabilities, and developmental disorders such as ADHD and autism. Children, again, at higher exposure levels, it can be delirium, seizures, clumsiness, or even coma. Aluminum can cause dementia, loss of coordination, loss of memory, disorientation, confusion, and it actually inhibits uptake of important chemicals by nerve cells like dopamine and norepinephrine. The other thing it's associated with is Alzheimer's. So more of those, uh, you know, cognition um, conditions can be related to aluminum. And so toxic metals, they speed the aging process. They slowly deactivate enzyme systems. And of course, as a review, they weaken body structure and have other degenerative effects. Ultimately, everyone has toxic metals in their tissues, even newborns. We're surrounded by toxic metals every day. I'm even breathing them in here at the office. The body uses whatever it has as its disposal when it needs minerals. So toxic metals can be used in replacement of nutrient minerals on binding sites if they need to. They also can replace other nutrient minerals in tissue sites such as arteries, joints, bones, muscles, leading them to be weakened and slowly destroyed by the replacement process. Toxic metals cause irritation, inflammation, and other toxic effects. They support the development of fungal, bacterial, and viral infections that may become chronic until the toxic metal is actually eliminated. Toxic metals can essentially short circuit the brain and nervous system in many ways, leading to many neurological and mental disorders. So again, it's so important for us to understand that toxic metals can accumulate in the body due to mineral deficiencies. So knowing what a body needs from a mineral perspective can help combat the sequestering of metals. And so I came across this picture a while back when I was doing some research and, and writing this presentation. And, you know, this one kind of hit when I, I saw this, I was like, wow, right? We think of how many things we see. And I mean, I grew up in, in an area with uh, chemical, val chemical plants. And so this was just like, oh, my goodness. And so we have to remember, you know, we are what we eat. So ensuring that we are checking for pure ingredients, eating whole foods, it's, it's paramount because it's the starting point, right? It's the starting point of our health. We have to know what we're putting into our bodies. 
So we're going to talk about a case study now. And I'm going to dive into the symptoms and issues with the individual, which included depression, included anxiety, and also included emotional trauma. And I want to kind of go through and just show you uh, what that looks like from a graphical perspective and assessing it on an HTMA test. And so you can see here, there's obviously some, some little kind of points that I had pulled out. And, and again, there's a lot going on here. I just pulled kind of plucked out the pieces that I really wanted to uh, focus on for this particular um, emotional component. And so, you know, kind of going back to talking about calcium, remember high calcification can be caused by trauma. And so we have that traumatic experience we're, 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 you know, we go through the emotions that are attached to that. Um, and, and we're, we want to be distanced from reality so that we can be socially withdrawn to be able to deal with what we're dealing with. But what happens is similar to, you know, a case like this is that now it's become chronic. Now it's become a lifestyle for us, right? Now we've put up a wall between us and the world. And this is a really high wall, right? 509 milligram percent for calcium. And then, and then we have magnesium loss. And so magnesium, remember we have calcium, we have high tissue calcium, we have, can have cells that are more calcified, they're harder to penetrate. And so magnesium being an intracellular mineral, isn't being able to, to get into the cell where it needs to go. So we call this a magnesium loss pattern. So the magnesium circulating being picked up in the hair because it's not in the cell where it actually needs to be to do the work. And so this can cause addictive behaviors and depression. Then we have a lack of sodium. Sodium is, remember, the contributing factor for adrenal strength, right? Adrenal expression, having that stress resiliency. We have a low potassium, right? So now we have low thyroid expression because potassium is very related to the thyroid. And then we have biounavailable copper. So we have a little bit of a copper elevation. So we have copper in the body. It's just not being in a usable fashion. And, and we have a lack of zinc. Because again, very similar to magnesium, zinc can be in a loss pattern. And so now that both of those actually can stimulate anxiety and hyperactivity. All right. So we've got some kind of mixed things going on here, but a lot to deal with. And then we have elevated cobalt. And I wanted to mention this one because I see it so often and it's so important. And when we have elevated cobalt, it can tell us a lot about our liver and our liver health. And the higher this number gets, the more congested our livers actually may be. And so, you know, important to be able to identify some of these things. And again, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of what we're looking at for the particular pattern here. I do want to kind of let you know what the ratios stand for if you don't have experience with HTMA. So the calcium to phosphorus is, you know, that is what I, uh, identifies our oxidation rate, but it also has a lot to do with the autonomic nervous system. And so the higher that number gets, the more the body is attempting to tap into parasympathetic dominance or rest and digest. And again, that's where that metabolism, right, our energy is lowering everything is slowing down right that calcium is rigid and heavy and it's slowing us down sodium to potassium i've mentioned that before it's the stress ratio calcium to potassium that's our thyroid ratio and so that's the thyroid expression and you can see this one is really high at 254 when the ideal is actually 4.2 zinc to copper is our hormone ratio right we need those to be in balance Zinc is related to progesterone, testosterone, copper is related to estrogen. Then we have our sodium to magnesium ratio, which is our adrenal ratio. And you can see this particular one here, right? When we're talking about, you know, a lack of energy being directly associated with depression, and we have a sodium to magnesium ratio that's at 0 0.05. It's barely a mark on the graph, the ideal is four, 
right? So there's a huge, huge lack of energy in this individual. And she definitely felt that. Calcium to magnesium. Remember I mentioned, right, insulin release. Calcium is responsible for uh, contributing to that and magnesium for uh, blood sugar regulation or glucose regulation. And so that, you know, together that this is our blood sugar ratio. So it's a little low here. So she's got some dysregulation going on. And then our iron to copper, that's an infection ratio. And so, you know, I don't really want to get into that one. And this, that's not what we're talking about here, but that's what the ratio represents. The higher it is, the more there could be bacteria, the lower, the more it can point to virus. And so depression, excess tissue levels of buy one available copper, right? That elevated copper. My ideal level is two. Hers was at three, right? Have a detrimental effect on energy levels is correlated with many forms of mental illness, including depression. Copper in most cases causes tissue calcium to rise, thus contributes to high calcium and magnesium levels noted in many depressed individuals. So a high copper level can actually contribute to a high tissue calcium, right? So again, it's important when we're looking at minerals to look at the whole picture of what that is and, and all the interrelationships. And this is one of the reasons why I feel the test is so interesting because there's always so much to learn and talk about and dive into, but it also makes it one of the harder ones to understand. And so again, studying and, and learning and understanding what some of these things mean is really important for you to be able to identify possibly what the person's feeling, but also what's physically going on. And so the next part I want to dive into is heart palpitations. And so in this particular case, she was having anxiety and heart palpitations. And so slow oxidizers, again, typical pattern here, high calcium, visually high magnesium, which is a loss, our sodium potassium are low, may experience palpitations, even tachycardia. And it's usually from low potassium levels or a loss of potassium because it can be like magnesium as well, where it's high because it's mainly intracellular. If it's not getting into the cell, it can be picked up in the hair at high levels, but it's a deficiency. Or biounavailable calcium, magnesium, copper, or zinc. So there's, there's a bioavailability within the mineral system as well. And it's important for us to understand the cofactors that assist minerals in being available if they're in the body at high levels and how do we how do we metabolize those how do we balance them heavy sweating by someone with a potassium level less than one to two milligram percent so remember this one's at two can experience cardiac arrest if the potassium level becomes too depleted so this is how important our minerals are right low levels of potassium less than four milligram percent can cause a feeling of that mental sympathetic dominance right we 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 talked about that and pushing the body physically into burnout because we're mentally sympathetic dominant we're not listening to the body anymore and so this is where we end up you know uh, clients end up pushing themselves kind of into that physical burnout because their mental capacity they're just they keep driving everything forward and and ultimately at that point you know then again we see the trickle down effect uh, as they slowly, slowly move into burnout. And so what do we do for basic support? Well, first off, we have to start with whole foods and hydration, right? That That's the base. Nutrition is the base. And, and good sleep, not just sleep, but good sleep, right? We have to be sleeping well. We have to be able to wake up refreshed so that everything has time to, to rest and repair. Organic kelp is a great addition because it's rich in iodine and other nutrients. Unrefined sea salt, right? Over 80 minerals in there. It's really important. And it's important not only to activate, you know, our cells and our energy, but again, to support our adrenals for stress resiliency. Binders are another great addition, right? To clean up and, and bind to the toxic and, uh, you know, toxins that we're breathing in or, or absorbing every day. Support for the GI, the liver, the kidneys, right? Working so hard, making sure that we're healthy. We have to think about, you know, even 
the association between the GI and the brain, right? When our gut is not functioning well, our brain isn't going to be functioning well either. We're going to have foggy thinking and we're not going to feel well. And I mean, there's so many things affected when our GI is not uh, optimal. And then there's three kind of, uh, you know, um, extras that I like, right? Boron, super important. Uh, boron is uh, an amazing contributor to the absorption of magnesium. It also regulates calcium, has many, many benefits. And magnesium, of course, because magnesium is our number one anti-stress mineral. And most people in most cases need a little bit of magnesium, if not more. And then vitamin K2, right? Remember I said 80% of those cases are slow oxidizers. That means we have a lot of people with tissue calcification and vitamin K2 helps to shuttle calcium into the bones and the teeth. So important for that aspect. And then in the very middle, we have stress. Stress reduction, right? Remember stress is at the base of imbalance. And so if we have stress, we can control. That's great. Let's reduce it. If we have stress that we can't, then we need to learn or teach clients how to deal with that stress and release it in a healthy way, whether that's walking, deep breathing, meditation, journaling, whatever that looks like. Um, that needs to be done because stress is, has a huge impact on our mineral system and causes a lot of mineral imbalance. And so the takeaway, an abundance of essential minerals in the diet supports the foundation of health, protects the body from toxic metal pileup and promotes energy and longevity. And thank you. You can find me on social media at Lisa Patel Killer or on my website, lisapatelkiller.com. You can also find us at clinical HTMA or clinicalhtma.com. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me for this presentation. Lisa, thank you so much. I mean, so uh, a, a different viewpoint, especially on, on the topic of trauma, which is timely right now. It's, it's all over. Everyone's talking about it. I know yeah. already there's a question about it. So I see there's a few questions in the Q&A, which I will call out. But if anybody else has questions, please pop them in there as well. So let's get to it. All right, Gabby would like to know, how do we avoid environmental toxins when it is sprayed in the air? Oh, well, honestly, you can't. <laughs> I wish I wish I had a different answer. Um, I will tell, I, I'll share with you kind of my thoughts just with regards to um, how to help yourself uh, mitigate that. I think one of the things that we can do when we're talking about things sprayed in the air, you know, most likely talking about pesticides and things like that. Um, and, you know, when we're thinking about that, one of the things I always think about is how do we outside of just remember, I said minerals, right? Minerals are kind of that strength foundation, but there's also binders. And so binders, there's different kind of levels of binders. And if you think about binders that you can use, you know, kind of consistently, if you will, again, always good to rotate things to give your body something different, but binders will help to bind to toxins. So even if, you know, if your minerals are good and, you know, uh, and we're breathing in, you know, what's in the air, or what have you, Binders can help to bind to toxins and then pull them through the system pretty efficiently. So I am a big proponent of, you know, you can use modified citrus pectin, there's apple pectin, there's uh, humic and fulvic acid, you can use chlorella. Um, if you're using something a little bit uh, shorter term, you can go with something like zeolite, you know, so there's lots of options to be able to help. And I, I think just based on you know what we're exposed to every day that having a binder on board especially something like humic and fulvic acid where you're getting minerals from it as well or even chlorella where you're getting other nutrients from it i think is a great healthy approach to be able to mitigate some of the toxins in our environment 
That that really makes sense. And and would you recommend taking some type of binder regularly? I I I do, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and again, if you're using something that's that's full of minerals and nutrients as well, then you're kind of getting, you know, the benefits of both sides of it. For sure. Makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Uh, Danielle would like to know, is there a scientific explanation for how emotional trauma increases calcium? I'm right with you. I want to know that too. There, there is. So, so basically from a, from a mineral, um, physiological perspective, what ends up happening is the first mineral to respond to stress is sodium, right? We have to have our adrenals kick up to put us into fight or flight. And so when that happens, the sodium to potassium ratio, right, that stress ratio that we talked about, it gets really high. And so when that happens, because ultimately what's what's happening is the kidneys start to recycle sodium, the body's being called upon for sodium to support the adrenals. And it's unfortunately at the expense of potassium. So as that ratio gets higher and higher, we end up needing more magnesium to keep that process at bay and to fight the inflammation that the sodium is bringing. Because remember, high sodium equals inflammation. And so because minerals are interactive, right? We have to look at the interrelationships between minerals. As soon as magnesium depletes, and now we have a deficiency, calcium doesn't have anything to stand in its way without to go up. Right. And so, but as that calcium starts to go up, it buffers what we're actually dealing with. So there, so again, it, there is a, a physiological response as it goes sodium to potassium and then magnesium uh, deficiency to calcification, but it also affects us then from a mental perspective and our emotions kind of introverting us so that we can deal with what's happening, that stress that's, that's in front of us. You know, it could be a loss of a loved one. It could be something as simple as, as a parasite, right? It's all going to have the same stress response reaction in the body. Well, that, that's super fascinating. Another person had asked a similar question too, and uh, she wants to know, actually it's an, uh, anonymous here. Mm -hmm. Here she would like to know, did the calcium elevation occur before the trauma or vice versa? So is there a scenario where high calcium can make you more prone to trauma? Not to my knowledge. The only time I've seen calcium uh, like that would be supplementation. Like usually, like I'll see there's clients that I've treated with osteoporosis um, and usually the calcification is high because they're supplementing. And what happens is the unfortunate part is, you know, a lot of us naturally, especially women, I find just from clinical experience tends to be women trend a little higher in calcium. And again, remember that, like, I, I feel like we are more apt to want to take care of things and, and we put more stress on ourselves, right? Everybody first and then us. Right. And so that also burns more magnesium. And so I think that's why a lot of times, you know, women end up with a little bit of a higher calcification again not extreme as the pattern i showed you but a little bit high um, and you have to be careful because osteoporosis can kick in if, if you've got low calcium but also if it's really high because it's in the tissues rather than in the bones and the teeth so we need to get it out of the tissues and back into the bones and the teeth where it actually belongs and that's again where you know your magnesium comes in your boron your mk7 and that's really one of the reasons why those three you know, kind of standalone supplements, uh, if you will, are a lot of my favorites just because of the mechanism and, and how they uh, act in the body and just based on the patterns that we see. Okay, thank you. That I, I think that's uh, quite comprehensive there then. Katie would like to know, what types of effects do you generally see from a copper IUD? Oh, well, um, there's many different ones. Um, so copper IUD from my experience uh, definitely can be some, I, I've had a couple of women who have had a copper IUD for a long period of time, and then it starts affecting them later. Okay, that's kind of an, it's kind of a, a standalone. That was maybe two or three. In a lot of cases, what happens is uh, copper IUD, you know, gets inserted and then, you know, within 
you know, six months, we start getting acne, right? Hormonal acne. And then we start getting moody and then we start getting cramping and PMS and just all the estrogen dominant symptoms. Estrogen and copper are very succinctly related. They're tied closely together. And so when the copper IUD is in a person, in a woman, it's going to constantly expose them to copper, which is then going to, the body's going to want to produce more estrogen. So it's kind of like a cycle that keeps going and it never stops. And so what happens is bile starts to thicken. Now we've got, and I step back, bile starts to thicken. So then we have uh, a lack of, um, the ability to metabolize estrogen. But then on top of that, what happens is copper is extremely stimulatory to our adrenals. And our adrenals are actually really important for the proper kind of breakdown and transport of copper because our adrenals help to support the liver's production of one of the main proteins that is a copper transporter, right? Copper can't, um, ride a bike by itself, it needs a taxi cab. And so the adrenals help the liver make those taxi cabs. And if the adrenals are being constantly stimulated by the copper, then it's not able to do that, right? They're not able to support the liver's production. And then all of a sudden, then we have more and more copper building in the system. And because of the oxidative stress that that brings to the table, the body is literally trying to just shove like open doors i would say open the closet door and like you have company coming over you shove everything in the closet you close the door right it's it's doing that every day and so what happens is it just keeps building and building and building and depending on how strong adrenal function started what your zinc stores were like right how your sodium was and there's other factors but the stronger that is in the beginning when the exposure first happens you know the longer the symptoms will take to kind of show up but um you know usually they do and they can be pretty severe uh with a copper iud so if you get tested then i presume there's ways to mitigate risks yeah yeah okay yeah um all right here we go with lithium orotate natalie Mm -hmm. would like to know benefits of lithium orotate for mood stability dealing Mm -hmm. with copper dumping symptoms she says i've seen practitioners like rick fisher recommend this Mm -hmm. how does lithium orotate affect the mineral system in the body and do you ever use it in your practice absolutely so lithium is great if you have somebody who has mood issues like if they're depressed or um you know so many different things uh i take lithium orotate every day uh, just five milligrams. Uh, that's, uh, you know, and we're not here to, to suggest or diagnose or anything like that. Well, that's not what we're doing, but I personally do that. Um, I think that lithium and boron together are kind of the new age biohack of anti-aging because they're, they're both good for brain health as well. Mitigating symptoms for copper, I don't use lithium for that necessarily. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use, you know, small amounts of molybdenum if that's necessary. Like there's lots of different strategies you can use to be able to mitigate, you know, a, a copper dump per se. Um, and one of the binders that I really like when we've got copper on board is zeolite, because that can really help to, to be able to just pull it from the body and be able to, uh, mitigate symptoms as well. Okay, good. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Natalie. Manira would like to know, oh, a comment. Thank you. It's very interesting. Does the HTMA also look at vitamins? I've been uh, on the lookout for a test that does minerals and vitamins. Yeah, so you're, you're not going to get vitamins from HTMA. It is a mineral test. Um, but there are, you know, in your treatment of increasing minerals and changing mineral patterns, you will use vitamins. So, for example, uh, you know, cobalt is in B12. It's part of B12. So, okay. So if low cobalt, you would definitely think about B12, but there's other vitamins, for example, like vitamin E raises sodium. Vitamin E helps to, um, create the usability and increase the usability of selenium, for example. So if you have low sodium, you'd bring in vitamin E. Calcification can be helped with vitamin A. Copper can also be made bioavailable with vitamin A. So that so if you have any of those issues going on, you're going to bring vitamin A in. So we use a lot of uh, vitamins based on the H2MA, but we're not necessarily getting 
you know, uh, or being able to identify the exact micronutrient level of a vitamin from the mineral test. Okay, thank you. So a couple other questions about binders, which mm -hmm. I think uh, you already addressed, what are some of the favorite binders that you like? But one specific one, can you take chlorella for a long time? Yeah, I mean, chlorella's um, been toted that it's safe to take forever. I mean, I'm a big proponent in in rotation. And, you know, even when you're talking about probiotics, like you would never take the same probiotic forever, right? Um, because you need to expose your body to different things so that your body just has a variety of, of, you know, what you're providing to it. It's like your diet, right? And so, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think chlorella can be taken I would say longer term, like if you want to take it for six months or something like that. I mean, you know, again, it's full of nutrients and things like that. Um, and I think humic and fulvic is very similar to that, right? You can, but again, I would want to rotate. I usually every three months I rotate my binder um, because again, you know, even humic and fulvic, it has a, a great attraction for glyphosate. So, you know, um, if you live in an agricultural area, you might want to use humic and fulvic through the spring and the summer when they're spraying and things like that to try and protect yourself as much as possible. And and then maybe in the winter you switch to something different. So I think I'm, I'm a big proponent in, you know, with binders and probiotics and things like that, just rotation, because again, I think the more things that the body that you can expose yourself to from a healthy perspective, um, you know, the better off you'll be. Yeah. And I think that's in line with our whole holistic philosophy that, that we learn at IHN. Yeah. So that makes sense. Here's a question about ADD. Is there a distinction between true innate ADD and ADD-like symptoms that are stemming merely from mineral imbalances? Or do you believe from your experience working with clients that they're basically the same thing? And can true ADD be cured through balancing minerals? Uh... That's a pretty loaded question. I mean, there's so many genetics and things that you have to consider and so many different angles that you have to look at why something's happening. And so I think that there are ways for if there is what you would, uh, you know, quote unquote, say true ADD, um, can it come from minerals? It can. Have I seen it uh, fixed or helped with minerals? I have. Um, I've seen even, even, you know, not even talking just about ADD specifically, but even with ASD, autism, children, nonverbal, and, you know, within three months, they're, they're putting sentences together for, for, with mineral balance. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways that minerals can help, even with a diagnosis of something that, you know, can't be fixed. Uh, fully, right? I think that there's ways that you can help provide a better quality of life. And I think you have to look at the reason uh, behind and dig to the root cause of, you know, why is the ADD something like, right? Is it coming from a mineral imbalance? It's kind of like thyroid. So you know what, some people have hypothyroidism, right? Can you help it with mineral balance? You can probably still going to need medication, you know, if you work through it, and you can kind of uh, use different protocols, you might be able to, to not have to go that route. Um, but there's also uh, a, a very high percentage where it's not a thyroid problem, it's a calcium potassium problem, right? So, so it really depends on the root cause and, you know, and the underlying premise of the diagnosis itself. Yeah. So, so cure is a, a loaded word, but definitely uh, hundred percent function. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent a loaded word. Yeah. I think we'll do three or four more questions, everyone, and then do the draw. So Emmeline would like to know, is it a waste of time, energy, and money to supplement with electrolytes and minerals based on cravings and being in tune without doing a test? And can you recommend the best testing method? I think the testing method here is the HTMA. Right. Can you repeat the beginning part? I just want to make sure I understood that right. Is it a waste of time or money to take the test or to supplement without taking the test? I guess that's to what I'm supplement unclear. based on cravings and being in tune without doing the test. I mean, you know, you, your body really is going to tell you what you need. Um, you know, if you're craving salt, 
probably means your adrenals need salt, right? You have to think about, I mean, I do a ton of work with animals. We've been working with animals for years and, you know, horses are very innate. They know exactly what they need. That's why they have salt licks, right? Um, if they're out in the field and it's summer and they're going to go through a lot more salt than usual and they do that on their own, right? So I think that there's a lot to be said for awareness and, um, yeah, and what you can, you know, if you're, if you're craving certain things, I think what it comes down to is understanding, again, having enough, um, having enough data, I'm a big data person, science, right, having enough data to understand, you know, what it is you do need. So perfect example would be if you're craving salt, and you know you're going through a stressful situation or maybe you don't even realize you're going through a stressful situation but you start craving salt so now you're eating salt but the underlying premise of that is my question is then what else is being affected right so if there is a stressful situation and you're craving salt you probably need the salt but you probably also need potassium and you need magnesium and right so there's other things involved than just what you're craving that may be needed to to be able to support or uh you know help the um the issue right and then so a good segue into the next question um elaine would like to know what is the best form of food sources for the minerals Oh boy, food sources. I mean, you got to go organic, um, whatever food you're choosing, you know, organic grass fed, you're going to have to do your research um, with regards to using complete food sources. I'm assuming that you would have, if you've been a grad from IHN, especially you've got a guide with a lot of the, the food sources, you know, even think about bee pollen and B12 and, you know, the different things like that. Um, acerola cherry, camu camu, you know, vitamin C, just again, making sure that they're organic because even when you're thinking about a powder, like a camu camu, if it's a concentrate, you know, you're, if it's not organic, you be, could be consuming concentrated heavy metals and, and toxins too. Right. So you have to be really careful, uh, with those particular choices and that you're making sure you're picking a reputable, you know, manufacturer, if it's something that is like that, like a powder that you're using as a concentrate. Okay, good. Uh, Paulina, yes, it's recorded. It will be sent to you. Um, how can I measure minerals correctly? That's with this test. That's what we're talking about. But she would like to know, what do you recommend for heavy metals detox? Uh, the best approach for heavy metal detox is provide the body the, med the minerals that it needs, right? The, the body doesn't want heavy metals. Right. If you've got heavy metals showing up anywhere, whether it's on a urine test or like what's being excreted and you do a push test or whether it's on your HDMA test, especially if you're a poor eliminator, like that slow oxidizer status that I talked about with the low adrenal function, low thyroid function. The first thing you need to do is put the minerals back into the system and the body will naturally start to detox heavy metals. And then once that happens, then you can use some heavy metal strategies. There's lots of strategies to detox heavy metals, but your body has to actually be ready to do that. And if you try and do that before putting your vital primary minerals back into the system, you're not going to get rid of them. Because think about, think about the relationship between even zinc and cadmium, right? So if you have a zinc deficiency and the body has cadmium in the environment, that it has access to, it's going to take that cadmium and it's going to put it on the zinc receptor because they're closely linked on the periodic table. So it's, it can, it can bind to the zinc binding sites. Now, if we do chelation to, to pull that cadmium, cadmium out of the body, but we still don't give the body any zinc, but the cadmium still in the environment, you can pull that cadmium out all day long. As soon as your chelation is over, you're going to still have cadmium because it's the only thing the body has to put on the zinc receptor, right? So if you put the zinc in the body first, then it, the body will naturally let go of the cadmium. It doesn't need it anymore. And then you can kind of go down the road of, of specific strategies to clean up the rest of the cadmium, if you will. But without the zinc on board, it's never going to go away. Yeah, so for detoxification, there really is an additive component first before uh, subtracting. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you have to prep the body for de detox is stressful. 
right? Yeah. You've got to, you've got to prep the body for that, make sure it's ready and make sure it has the right things in place to be able to do it. And again, to, to let metals go, if that's what's involved. We, we only have three more uh, questions. I know I just set that up, but <laughs> maybe good. we could uh, get everybody. All chance, good. If you're, if you're good with that. Yep. What makes potassium raise so much in a fast metabolizer? considering mm. it's one of the minerals that most people get too little of through the diet. And where does potassium really come from? And is the high potassium really a loss pattern, loss pattern in a fast metabolizer? Can you say the second part? I missed one word of the second where part. Where does potassium really come from? Where does potassium really come from? Uh, okay, so when, when in a fast metabolizer, when sodium increases, so here's here's what I I think is potassium increases because it has anti-inflammatory effects, and sodium is an inflammatory, right? So as sodium increases, the inflammation of the body increases. I do believe there's a portion of that that is contributing to apoptosis, right? Because as inflammation increases, cell turnover is going to increase, right? Um, we're not in a healthy state, so the apoptosis is happening faster. And of course, then intracellular minerals are being leaked out and potassium is one of them. Um, but it does, it, it will raise simply because of the fact that the recycling in the kidneys, um, you know, will, will change as, as the stress pattern changes. And so we'll see the both elevate on the test in a fast oxidizer. Is it in a loss pattern? It potentially can be. And so that's why with HTMA, it's really important, especially if you have someone who has an elevated potassium over the optimal range of 10, that you compare it with blood labs. Because the blood labs are going to tell you where the potassium is in the serum. So simple example would be if you have an elevated potassium like the one we saw 86 for example um you could have a blood lab for that that uh, for that person where the potassium's at four well the functional range is four to four point five so if the functional range is four to four point five and the potassium in the blood is at four and on hma it's at 86 person probably needs potassium right? It's a, it's a major loss pattern. But if the potassium is at 86 on HTMA and it's at six on blood, then you know you've got kind of a true number that you have to kind of pull potassium out of, you know, supplementation or even, you know, watch how much they're getting in food for that time being, because, you know, otherwise you could be driving hyperkalemia. So it's really important um, to be, you know, just doing a simple blood comparison. And I mean, most doctors will run um, you know, a, you know, we call the comprehensive metabolic panel in the US. I'm not sure what they call it in Canada, but it's just you got calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, chloride, right? So the basic panel that you can do some comparison. Yeah, there's so many moving parts. That's why you really need to be trained well in this. Okay. Second last one. How would you explain the anxiety that starts when a person takes magnesium supplementation? Kate would like to know. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because everybody reacts a bit differently. And so we were talking about this today in one of our groups because there's vitamin deficiencies um, that are related to chelates of magnesium. And, you know, I, magnesium is important for energy. So it's very possible that the magnesium is contributing to energy and then other minerals are missing and now the person is anxious. So it could be as simple as the elemental part. The other part though, you have to think about the chelate. So that's what the magnesium is attached to. And so if the magnesium is attached, if it's a magnesium malate, for example, it's attached to organic acid, malic acid, right? And so, you know, vitamin deficiencies of niacin, for example, B3 or CoQ10 can have the body react to the malic acid if they don't have enough of B3 or CoQ10. And so, and same thing with glycinate, it reacts if there's B, no B6, right? So sometimes it can be a reaction to the magnesium itself because of the energy production. Sometimes it can be a reaction to, to the chelate that magnesium is bound to and a deficiency that could be uh, causing that reaction as well. So there's kind of multifaceted things that might be going on depending on the person. Um, yeah. Again, a lot of moving parts there. Yeah. Okay. I think this will be our last question uh, by Gabby. Do you have any mineral com 
combinations that you recommend for ADHD? Uh, I mean, I base everything on HDMA. Um, so just, I mean, specifically for ADHD, I mean, I, I, I don't really have anything because I don't, I don't, that's not the, what, how I do it. Um, I know there are, I actually just interviewed one of our practitioners yesterday, Dana, um, and I know she has, you know, some uh, recommendations she puts together specifically for ADHD. She also does cryptopyral testing because that's, can be a big driver of ADHD, right? Zinc deficiency, B6. Um, so that's another kind of part of that too. And I, you know, I guess for me, it's when we're talking about conditions of any kind, doesn't matter if it's ADD, ADHD, diabetes, whatever it is. Um, I like to start with minerals because it just gives me, it gives me a little bit of data to be able to draw a conclusion to at least know what the person's body needs rather than guessing. Um, and, and then you can build on it from there, right? Like I mentioned blood labs. And I mean, there's other things you can do too, if you need to, with regards to diagnostic testing. But I think that's kind of a starting point. I feel like it's just, you kind of need a little bit of a blueprint to know what's going on in the body so that you know what the most effective protocol can potentially be. You know, otherwise we're just guessing. Okay, that's a very valid point. Um, all right. I think I think that's it for the questions for today. It is uh, long past when we thought we would finish. And I've had a quick look. Our lucky winner of the giveaway today is Andrea Pusel. Can you just put a little note there in the chat to make sure uh, that you want this giveaway? And I know you're here. I just checked. So uh, yes, please. Okay, wonderful. Andrea, we will be in touch uh, from IHN to Amazing. let you know how you can get that sorted out. So congratulations. Congratulations, Lisa, Andrea. Thank you very much for sharing your time and expertise. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm just blown away. Minerals and emotions and mental health. I mean, I knew minerals and mental health were a attached to each other, but how you could link the emotions to it. it. It's just amazing. And thank, thank you. you all participants for joining with us live today. If you want to learn more by Lisa, the upcoming uh, continuing education uh, courses is starting on March 19th on a Tuesday, six weeks, go to the IHN website for more information or to register. And you should learn some really interesting stuff. So thanks again, everybody. I wish you a good day. Good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Thanks for having me.